I'm not sure if you can see me or if you can just see my holding slide, but my name is Georgie and I'm the Manager of Advocacy and Industry Development for BioEnergy Australia. So um, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar is going to be really interesting. I think I've been looking forward to this one. It's um, quite forward looking and will hopefully answer lots of questions you might have about what's possible and what we need to do to get there um, to our cleaner, greener future. So we'll be hearing various pieces of research and analysis on the topic of a global transition to cleaner fuels. Um, this webinar is brought to you by one of Bioenergy Australia's member working groups, the Cleaner Fuels Alliance. Uh, will be moderated by Keith Sharp from TFA, TFA, not TFA, sorry, Keith. Um, now, if anyone is interested in hearing more about membership of Bioenergy Australia or the Cleaner Fuels Alliance, please do get in touch with me. I'd be happy to tell you all about it. Um, today's webinar, so we'll be hearing uh, feature presentations in three sections. So the first, we'll be looking at net zero by 2050. So research um, that will be delivered to you by Timothy Goodson, um, who is an energy modeler and analyst with the International Energy Agency, and Praveen Baines, who is a clean energy modeler with the International Energy Agency. They will be followed by the second presentation, um, and that will be delivered by Dr. Chris Greig, who is Senior Research Scientist at Princeton University, looking at his work on Net Zero America. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Felix Leach, who is the author and Associate Professor of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, who will discuss his work, um, Racing Towards Zero, The Untold Story of Driving Green. Um, we'll then have some questions and answers. So that, that section will be delivered by Keith Sharp or moderated by Keith Sharp from TFA. Just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, can I ask that everyone mutes their microphones and turns off their cameras so that we just avoid any interruptions and distraction from that end? Um, and if I could please um, ask that you save your questions until the end of the presentations. You can even um, pop them into the chat function on the um, on the side, the right sidebar of the screen, so that Keith, when we when we get to the question and answer section, Keith can reference those and um, fill the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, finally, just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Bioenergy Australia's YouTube channel. So do feel free to share it with your networks after it is completed. Thank you so much. And I will now pass on to our first speakers, Timothy Goodson and Praveen Baines. Thank you. Thanks very much, Georgie. Hello, everyone. So I'll just share my screen with you. And let me just stop presenting. There we go. Great. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody see that? Um, yes. Is that all good? Sorry, Georgie, yeah. can you see see the screen? Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, as you mentioned, very excited to be here today. And today we're going to be uh, speaking briefly about the recently released um, Net Zero by 2050 report published by the International Energy Agency. So, um, I'll give a, a brief overview of the report, looking at the wider energy sector, and then we'll zoom in on on the role of bioenergy. And my colleague Praveen will focus in on specific. Um, elements of the bioenergy question in net zero pathways. Um, and so just a, a bit of context in terms of where we're starting um, in, in this report and, um, and the role of the report. So as we know, there's been a lot of ratcheting up of ambition with new pledges um, aiming to get towards net zero by mid-century, um, now announced by, by many countries. And so if we tally all these up, we're looking at around 70% of global GDP and CO2 emissions that are now covered by such, such pledges. But the important point here is that fewer than a quarter of these pledges are actually um, fixed in domestic legislation um, and underpinned by specific measures or policies to deliver the pledges. Um, so this is what motivates the report to highlight that additional policies are needed to achieve the existing pledges. And then also there's this big ambition gap between the pledges that are out there and what we actually need to hit net zero by 2050. So as we head into COP towards the end of the year, um, we're hoping that the, this work will help fuel debate and really highlight a pathway that does exist for the energy sector to get to, to net zero by 2050. 
Um, now, in terms of what's required, we need urgent action, as we all know. Um, IPCC is telling us that by 2030 to stay on track for a 1.5 degrees warming, so 50% uh, chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, we need to reduce emissions from around 33 gigatons today to just over 20, so 21 gigatons um, by 2030. So a 12 gigaton reduction in the next 10 years. Um, and obviously requiring or doing that means that we need um, sustainable recoveries as we come out of COVID pandemics. We need money directed towards um, clean energy measures. And unfortunately, that's not quite what we're seeing at the moment, with only 2% of total fiscal measures so far actually being dedicated towards clean energy. So that really needs to ramp up um, if we are to keep this net zero pathway by 2050 open to the world. Um, now, in terms of technology evolutions that we're going to need to see, um, in our pathway, we, uh, we look at um, solar PV and wind in the power sector, and we can see that over the last, um, the last decade, uh, annual capacity additions have quadrupled for solar PV and wind, and this is exactly what needs to happen over the next decade to 2030. We need a quadrupling of average annual capacity additions, hitting 1,000 gigawatts of um, capacity added in 2030. So by the time we get to 2030, we'll need wind and solar to provide around 40% of global electricity generation, up from around 9% today. So just to give you a sense of scale, this means we need to be installing the world's biggest solar park with a capacity of around 2.2 gigawatts nearly every day in 2030. Now in terms of transport, electric car sales need to rise 18 fold between 2020 and 2030. So going from just over 3% of sales today to about 60% of total sales. And by 2035, there needs to be no more sales of internal combustion engine cars globally. Now boosting energy efficiency is also absolutely key. This is important for increasing energy security as well because even with rapid growth and low emissions power generation, the safest energy supplies really are those that we don't need in the first place. So here we're talking about measures in industry, buildings, appliances and transport, measures that can be really scaled up rapidly um, and so be very impactful over the next decade. And thanks to these in our pathway, the energy intensity of the global economy improves at around 4% per year on average through to 2030. So this is at least double what we've seen in, in the recent decade. Now, in terms of technologies that we need to achieve net zero, all the technologies needed to achieve the emissions reductions required to 2030 and put the world on track for net zero by 2050 are actually available in the market today. So yes, we need improvements in these technologies, we need them to increase in maturity, but the actual technologies to achieve these reductions are available. So technologies from efficiency, renewables, electric cars, and many more. But a very important message is that achieving a full transition to net zero by 2050 requires more than these technologies that we have available today. It will require tackling emissions in sectors like long distance transport, heavy industries, where we know that the technologies that can help achieve um, our full de decarbonisation, but we don't actually have these technologies in the markets and available competitively today. And in fact, many of these technologies are still at the demonstration or even the prototype stage. And so here what we're showing is that almost 50% of the CO2 emissions reductions in this net zero pathway um, by 2050 come from technologies that are currently not yet at a commercial scale. But there are many technology options that can help decarbonize these sectors. Typically, we're talking about electrification technologies, carbon capture, utilization, storage, hydrogen, sustainable bioenergy. Um, and here we can see many other examples. So advanced battery designs that we could um, help us to electrify heavy duty trucks, short di di uh, distance shipping, and maybe even short flights. Um, and most of these are still at the prototype today. We'll also need to successfully demonstrate carbon capture utilization and storage in cement um, to address process emissions. So really to make sure we're hitting on all these hard to abate sectors, we do need a big ramp up of, um, of innovation and technology progress. So um, electrolyzers for hydrogen production, other examples of, of the technologies we're talking about here. Um, so what this means is that the pace of innovation for clean energy technologies um, must be more and much faster than what we've seen in the past. 
Um, so given the short time we have left to bring these technologies to market, we need several demonstration projects to be undertaken in parallel, many different configurations and in many regional contexts. So this is a very different sort of paradigm of technology innovation to what we've seen in the past. Um, and so for governments, there's a big need to ramp up spending and R&D. So if we look at planned R&D spending in clean technologies through to 2030, we have around 25 billion budgeted by governments, and this needs to ramp up to around 90 billion. A second point is we need much more international co cooperation to accelerate this innovation, develop international standards and coordinate the scale up of these clean energy technologies. Um, now we present in detail this pathway to net zero emissions by 2050, focusing on these targets for net zero in 2050. But we need to be very clear that just having the target isn't sufficient. We need to have a series of milestones along the way. We need detailed policy frameworks to make sure we're on track all the way through to 2050. And so this means that a transition to net zero will come with many milestones. Milestones that could be um, in terms of changes to policy, technology deployment, technology innovation, etc. So in the report, we touch on around 400 milestones. I'm not going to bring them all up now, but I will touch on a few just to give a sense of the scale um, and the type of messages that we're trying to communicate with this report. Um, so first, hydrogen is set to become an increasingly important part of the energy mix um, on the road to net zero. So already through to 2030, hydrogen production needs to scale up from almost nothing today to 150 million tonnes with a concurrent big increase in electrolyzer installations. Um, we recognise that the power sector um, has a multitude of, of options to decarbonise electricity supply. Um, so in our scenario, the power sector is decarbonised before all other sectors. So here, net zero by 2040 and even earlier in, in advanced economies, then allowing other sectors to decarbonise via electrification. Um, and then we also see around 70% of electricity generation globally coming from solar PV and wind and around 5% coming from bioenergy with bioenergy providing a, a key source of dispatchable flexible generation to help complement solar PV and wind. So now I'll, I'll pass on quickly to focusing on bioenergy. Um, so really bioenergy is a central component of the decarbonisation that we see across almost all sectors of the economy with these sectors taking advantage of the versatility of bioenergy, so using it in solid, liquid or gaseous form. Um, and another key advantage is the ability of many bioenergy products to be um, to make use of the existing transmission and, di and distribution infrastructure that we have already in the energy sector and making use of existing end user equipment as well. So this is a, a huge advantage in this context of, of achieving net zero where we need to ramp down quickly and modify the way um, and the emissions intensity of, um, of existing equipment. So whether that be power stations, boilers or you know, internal combustion engines in vehicles. Um, so the advantages of bioenergy mean that we're, we're ramping up the use of bioenergy from around 25 um, uh, sorry, around 30 exajoules today to 70 exajoules in 2030, and then right up to around 100 exajoules in 2050. So you'll notice that at the start, we're excluding um, the bioenergy used for traditional use of biomass, because in our view and in the wider view, this is an unsustainable use of biomass given the health implications, the pollution implications. So in line with um, SDG goals, this is phased out in the scenario by 2030. Um, now, if we look in more detail at where this bioenergy is actually being used in the energy system, then firstly, we can see in the building sector, solid bioenergy demand increasing to close to um, 10 exajoules in 2030 and then growing further. Um, and then a lot of um, bioenergy demand in the industry sector where we're looking at um, replacing um, fossil fuel use for providing uh, high, te high temperature process heat. Um, and then obviously in the power sector as well. Um, and if we go forward, then liquid biofuel use is also increasing um, rapidly with consumption rising from around 1.6 MBOD um, today through to 6 MBOD in 2030 and then slight growth further to 2050. Um, now, 
we'll, we'll discuss this uh, in more detail later, but liquid biofuels use really is transitioning from in the next decade, um, a lot of growth in the road sector, especially in heavy transport. And then as we increasingly electrify some of those uses, moving really to the hardest to abate sectors such as aviation. Um, there's also an increasing ramp up of uh, biogases and notably biomethane. So blending this biomethane in gas networks um, and then getting towards 100% biomethane or direct use of biomethane in transport or in industry in, 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 um, in many regions. And finally, the conversion losses associated with, with um, biofuels production. So I'll pass over to Praveen now to go into a bit more detail of the process routes and some of the technologies involved here. All right, thanks, Tim. So we'll start off by taking a look at gaseous biofuels in more details. So as Tim mentioned, total gaseous biofuels production steadily increases between today and 2050. And in this case, biogases refers both to the raw biogas that can be used directly or to biogas that can be upgraded to biomethane and used in industry, power plants, or blended into the gas grid. So if you click once more, Tim. So thanks to the blending method, uh, mandates that Tim mentioned uh, for gas networks, average blending rates increased to above 80% of blending into the gas grid in many regions by, tw by 2015, the net zero emission scenario. And it reaches a global average of over 20%. The vast majority of this biogas is produced from anaerobic digestion from or organic wastes, such as municipal solid waste, wastewater and agricultural residue and manure. Transforming these waste products into bioenergy is a valuable means of extracting value from the waste and assists in its treatments, destroying pathogens and transforming the waste into a product that we can use as a fertilizer. So now we'll go on to the next slide and talk more about liquid biofuels. So liquid biofuel consumption more than triples between today and 2030 in the net zero scenario, mainly for use in heavy duty trucks. So if we click once more. So sustainable biofuels can use existing distribution networks that are traditionally used for petroleum derived fuels and can also be used in vehicles with only minor or no alterations. This enables them to decisively cut road freight emissions over the next decade to help keep the world on track for net zero emissions. At the same time, electricity and hydrogen fueled vehicles, vehicle models need to be scaled up to account for around 50% of truck sales by 2030. As electricity increasingly dominates road transport, the use of advanced liquid biofuels shifts to areas that are harder to electrify, such, such as shipping and aviation. Starting in the late 2020s, advanced liquid biofuels start to make important contributions to reducing emissions from aviation, where alternative low carbon options are very limited. In 2030, biojet kerosene, which is a drop in substitute for jet kerosene, accounts for almost 15% of total fuel, con fuel consumption in aviation. And by 2050, almost half of total liquid biofuel production is sent to the aviation sector. Uh, sector, which provides around 45% of total aviation energy use. Biofuels are a cornerstone for near-term sustainable aviation fuel production, as routes such as power to liquids take longer to commercialize. So for biofuels to deliver the near-term decarbonization, their production must drastically ramp up over the next decade, with a special focus on advanced biofuels. In 2050, 90% of liquid biofuels are advanced, which is up from just under 1% today. And in this case, advanced refers to the biomass feedstock used to produce the biofuels and includes uh, feedstocks such as waste and residues, as well as non-food energy crops grown on marginal lands. We'll discuss the uh, bioenergy supply chain in more detail in the next slide. So key biofuel production technologies like biomass gasification and cellulosic, uh, cellulosic ethanol fermentation underpin the expansion of advanced biofuels. These conversion technologies can take advantage of a variety of waste and residue feedstocks, such as crop residues, municipal solid waste, and forestry residues. But these technologies also represent some of the largest innovation gaps in the bioenergy value chain. Currently, biomass gasification and fissure tropes synthesis is at the demonstration scale, 
despite it being projected to contribute significantly to sustainable aviation fuels in 2040 and beyond. The same is true of the alcohol to jet production route with the additional benefit that alcohol to jet technology can be added to existing ethanol plants. However, despite the currently low technology readiness status of today for these conversion technologies, there are several commercial scale technologies in the pipeline and set to come online in the next couple of years. So we'll have to watch these as these will be critical in setting the course for 2050. Finally, a large portion of biofuel production is also coupled with carbon capture and storage, shown as the um, cross-hatched areas on the graph. Many of the advanced routes produce an almost pure stream of CO2 that can then be easily captured and stored underground when CO2 storage is available. These include the biomass gasification uh, for biomethane or used to create bioliquids, cellulosic fermentation to uh, ethanol, and biogas upgrading to biomethane. By 2050, about two thirds of ethanol production and more than half of the advanced biodiesel production utilizes CCUS. When considering all forms of bioenergy, around 10% are used in facilities equipped with carbon capture utilization and storage, and around 1.3 billion tons of CO2 is captured using bioenergy with CCS. Around 45% of this CO2 is captured in biofuels production, while around 40% is in the electricity sector and the rest is in heavy industry, notably cement production. So now we'll turn to the picture of bioenergy and waste supply in the net zero pathway. Our modeling recognizes that there are constraints to expanding the supply of bioenergy, and there are possible trade-offs with sustainable development goals, including avoiding conflicts at the local level with other uses of land, notably for food production and biodiversity protection. To navigate these risks, we ended up partnering with, uh, for the first time, with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, or IASAS, and we utilize their global biosphere and management model to provide insights on, on bioenergy supply, land use, and emissions. Using our combined modeling tools, we ensured that the level of bioenergy demand in our scenario remains well within the potential for sustainable supply of bioenergy and waste. Mitigating the impacts of bioenergy demand on global land use and avoiding competition with food prices and pressure on biodiversity hotspots and forests means maximizing the use of bioenergy and waste from residues and waste streams that do not require dedicated land use. In the net zero emission scenario, over 60% of the 100 exajoules of global bioenergy supply in 2050 comes from sustainable waste streams that do not require dedicated land use, and this is compared with only 20% uh, 20 today. This includes agricultural residues, organic municipal solid waste, and forestry industry residues. Of these sustainable waste streams, Forestry residues from wood processing and forest harvesting provide around 20 exajoules of bioenergy in 2050. This is less than half of current best estimates for the total technical potential. Investments in comprehensive waste collection and sorting in the net zero scenario unlocked close to 45 exajoules of bioenergy supply from the various waste streams we mentioned before, including these agricultural residues, food processing residues, industrial and municipal organic waste streams, and others. Much of the collected organic waste is used to produce biogases, while a major component of solid waste and agriculture residues are used directly in furnaces to provide heat in industry or generate electricity and heat, as well as sent to advanced biofuel production. Use of waste for these purposes grows rapidly in our scenario as collection improves. It is important that all such waste is combusted completely at high temperatures to ensure no negative impacts on air pollution. Almost all waste used for energy purposes in the net zero scenario is biogenic, and this is due to major efforts to firstly, replace plastic packaging with biosource materials. Secondly, reduce the usage of materials for packaging, manufactured goods and buildings. And three, increase pr plastic recycling rates rising from 15% in 2020 to 55% in 2050.
And these factors mean that plastics and other non-renewable waste ending up in waste streams going to incinerators represent a tiny fraction of total bioenergy and waste. The remaining 40 exajoules of bioenergy supply in the net, uh, net zero scenario requires land use. And this is compared with about 25 exajoules from bioenergy crops and forestry plantations that require land use today. However, there's no overall increase in cropland use for bioenergy production in the net zero scenario, as a shift away from conventional bioenergy crops such as sugarcane and corn free up land for short rotation woody crops, which can often be more productive on the same land and are used to provide both solid bioenergy as well as inputs into biofuel production. A further source of bioenergy supply is sustainably managed forestry plantations and tree plantings integrated with agricultural production via an agroforestry system, and these do not conflict with food production and biodiversity. Sustainably managed forest plantations established outside of existing forested land can increase carbon stocks while at the same time sustainably produce biomass. These produced just over 10 exajoules of bioenergy in 2050. Finally, a note on emissions. The net zero scenario achieves net zero emissions, CO2 emissions for the energy sector and industry process emissions without relying on any negative emissions in other sectors such as land use. Measures relating to land use emissions are not explicitly part of our net zero scenario. Nonetheless, the increase in short rotation woody bioenergy production from marginal lands and pasture lands, as well as the switch from conventional bioenergy crops to advanced short rotation woody crops, would sequester around 190 million tons of CO2 by 2050. And it would uh, reduce emissions, land use emissions, by 140 million tons of CO2 relative today. Other lever levers would be needed to fully eliminate CO2 emissions from the land use changes. Reducing deforestation by two-thirds by 2050, instituting improved forest management practices for bioenergy plantations and other forests, and planting around 250 million hectares of new forests would see CO2 emissions become net negative by 2040 and absorb 1.3 billion tons of CO2 annually by 2050. I hope these insights into the International Energy Agency's Net Zero by 2050 pathway have been of interest, and thank you all for your attention. I'll now hand over to Dr. Chris Grieg, who will present on Net Zero America. Dr. Grieg is a senior research scientist at Princeton University. So over to you. Thanks very much, uh, and uh, thanks for the invitation to join this. I'll start sharing my... Uh, slides. And just confirming everyone can see that. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about a study called Net Zero America that we released uh, at Princeton in uh, December 2020. Um, which has had quite a remarkable reception from US policymakers, including the White House. And uh, we think it's been quite influential in some of the recent announcements by Biden uh, to reduce emissions to 50 to 52 percent below 20, uh, 2005 uh, and to go to net zero um, by, 2030, uh, by 2050. So, um, one of the unique things we did in this study was really to take our modeling, which, which uh, found five pathways to net zero, different technological approaches, and to downscale them at a high level of resolution, which will allow us to cite the tens of thousands of uh, uh, assets and infrastructure that had to be built. Um, we built the scenarios on, on six pillars of decarbonisation. So we're talking about economy-wide decarbonisation, so the energy and industrial sector, the top four, which includes the energy productivity type uh, of changes that uh, Tim spoke of. Um, for the US being an advanced economy, ours are not quite as aggressive as Tim's, but, but are still uh, doubling of historical trends. The second pillar, clean electricity, 
wind, solar and generation, uh, transmission and firm power, so things like natural gas with CCS, nuclear, uh, hydro, but also bioenergy with CCS. And then the third pillar is zero carbon fuels and feedstocks for the chemical industry. Uh, and here bioenergy features again. Uh, and then carbon capture and storage, which is applied to uh, variously these, these sectors here, along with the industrial sector. Now, we also looked at reducing non-CO2 emissions from the land sector, so things like animal methane and nitrous oxides from per fertiliser, and also what were plausible trends for enhancing natural land sinks. The bottom line for these is we end up with a net residual positive CO2, CO2 equivalent emissions, which meant our energy and industrial sector has to go slightly negative by about 170 million tonnes by 2050. So we build these five scenarios by varying different levers. So the first lever, this is the business as usual, uh, trend from 2020 to 2050, so no new policies. Uh, and you can see fossil fuels stay quite dominant. In our net zero scenarios, we're basically, we have two uh, demand side scenarios where we have high electrification, so virtually complete in things like light duty vehicles and building heat uh, and some industries, and then a less high electrification. We're still on that electrification trend, but the pace is slower. So it's probably gonna, instead of being fully electrified by 2050, it's going to take another 20 years. And you can see in these scenarios, we get a sub substantial reduction in uh, fossil fuel use, coal essentially disappearing, um, but, but we still get quite a bit of fossil fuel use offset by CCS. And in these scenarios, our model essentially optimizes the supply side to minimize the net present value of the, of the transition. In this middle scenario, we take this less electrification case and we provide more biomass for the, uh, for the uh, supply side. So this is recognising the need for more clean fuels and more, more bioenergy, and so we expand our bioenergy uh, supplies. And then on the, the right-hand side, we have two um, supply side scenarios, which take the high electrification case and essentially, in this case, restrain the development of renewables to not exceed the fastest we've ever seen before in the US. So roughly around 30 gigawatts of combined wind and solar. And we maintain that year on year. And in this case, we see a lot more nuclear uh, and, and natural gas with CCS and a continuing use of some oil. And then we had 100% renewables. So this, this scenario doesn't allow any geologic sequestration and only allows wind, solar and bioenergy with the existing hydro. Uh, so, so I'm going to focus largely on this scenario, um, but I will take a look at this scenario in respect of the bioenergy case as well. Um, and I'm going to focus just on bioenergy for, for the purposes of this presentation. So essentially in our core scenarios, the four of the five that, that have this uh, basic level of biomass, we have a similar principle that was discussed in the previous pre presentation where we have no conversion of croplands to new bioenergy. So essentially what we allow is existing lands that are used for corn ethanol, which is blended into gasoline in the US, to be converted to um, uh, uh, high density or high yielding energy grasses. So, so these are essentially these areas here. And the rest is made up of forest residues, crop residues uh, and various waste streams along with what we call conservation reservation program lands, where farmers are encouraged to convert some of their agricultural lands to, um, to more sustainable processes and, and energy grasses qualifies. So in this case, we have 13 exajoules of uh, biomass available, and you can see we've mapped the biomass productivity down to 100 by 100 mile radiuses. Uh, and you can see this is the, the proximity of the various bioenergy crops are quite dense in, in the mid, upper Midwest uh, and, and in parts of the East Coast. In our enhanced biomass su supply case, what we now allow is for some future uh, uh, crop lands to be developed for energy grasses. So this is um, adopting the full extent of the USDOE's billion ton study that came out in 2016 
Uh, and in this case, we're expanding bioenergy supplies to 24 exajoules. And you can see here, it requires a much more uh, stronger intensification of biomass production. We also uh, develop supply cost curves for all of these different sources. These are developed from the DOE uh, study uh, and applied them to our energy system model. So where does this uh, um, biomass get converted to? So uh, across the five scenarios, so we have our reference cases, business as usual, you can see we continue to use biomass principally for, um, uh, for, for gas, uh, ethanol and gasoline. But in all of the other scenarios, what we find is firstly, the model chooses to use all of the biomass available. So 13 exajoules in the case of the, the four scenarios and then the 20, 23 and a half exajoules in the case of um, the, the sort of expanded biomass case. And the various um, technologies that are adopted are some for power. So the gray section here, which is coupled with CCS. Um, some are a lot for hydrogen, which is this uh, blue um, uh, section here, and some for pyrolysis li liquids, which goes into various chemical feedstocks. Now, the hydrogen use is adopted for various, um, it, it can be used in the indirect end use, but it can also be used to synthesize fuels, whether it be for aviation or other uses uh, via fissure troughs. So um, what's important is, that hydrogen is a pretty important carrier. I'll just note also there is some synthetic gas use in the high renewables case. Um, but, but we see basically ethanol disappearing. This is a function of the electrification. Uh, we see some, ele some electricity generation, but we see a strong dependence on hydrogen, both as an intermediate, uh, but also liquid fuels. Now, I want to dwell on hydrogen because it turns out to be a pretty important carrier uh, in the transition, some of it for direct use, some of it as an intermediate. But essentially, when you look at the sources of hydrogen in all of our scenarios, all of our net zero scenarios, um, bioenergy, the green, and electrolysis dominate. If we constrain renewables, then we see um, uh, natural gas reforming come into its own. Uh, and if we limit ourselves to 100% renewables, then we see uh, electrolysis tending to dominate uh, and hydrogen playing a bigger role. Now, where does the hydrogen get used? Well, it, it gets used directly in demand side. So this is a combination of um, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, depending on the scenario, uh, particularly for heavy duty uh, vehicles, direct reduction of iron in steel making uh, and some process heat, but also in synthetic liquids for aviation, um, for heavy duty transport in some cases, uh, and then in hydrogen boilers and in some electricity cases. Um, now, what's also interesting is the transition. Now, I'm just gonna focus on the E plus case, so this, this case here, and uh, but, but it also explains why hydrogen turns out to be pretty important. So you can see that from a, from a purely cost point of view, the scenario initiates with um, converting natural gas with uh, CCS into hydrogen. And of course, that makes sense in the US where natural gas prices are very, very competitive at $3 a gigajoule roughly. Um, but the next technology to really compete is, is biomass gasification with CCS. And then finally, uh, in this particular scenario, but in most scenarios other than the 100% renewables, electrolysis really only comes into its own uh, in the last decade. Now, the reason why um, hydrogen is important is because it allows us some flexibility in how we deploy the use of the bioenergy. So initially, the hydrogen we're producing, whether it be from uh, natural gas or from uh, biomass sources, is coming from, um, is, is going to the petrochemical sector. And, it's, and then it's going to transport. So then we start to get some synthesis uh, of liquids for, for heavy transport or hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, and later in the scenario, it's going to, sorry, that is for hydrogen fuel cells. And then later in the scenario, it goes to liquid fuels. Um, so, so we really, the hydrogen has this important versatility depending on how the scenario uh, unfolds over time. Now, I mentioned earlier that we did some downscaling. So essentially starting with that, um, those maps of the biomass sources, 
what we did is, and we did this in, in five-year time steps, and I'm just going to go directly to 2050, but we cite all of the bioenergy facilities that will be built in five-year time steps across the scenario. So, so in this particular scenario, we build a 1,000 new facilities, uh, individual biomass facility, bioenergy conversion plants uh, by 2050. And you can see there's a concentration of them in the Midwest. The larger dots represent clusters. So essentially that size of cluster there represents about 16 facilities, uh, individual bio facilities in that area. And you can see the purple is uh, pyrolysis liquids that are, that are coupled with CCS. The orange are uh, power plants that, that are fed with um, uh, biomass. Um, and the green are these high bio, you know, gasification to hydrogen projects. Um, and so, you know, the hydrogen, you can see the dominance of the hydrogen, but also of the pyrolysis liquids. Now, what I've also shown on this particular chart is the presence of our CO2 storage sites. So we worked here with the oil and gas sector to uh, character, to come up with our best characterization of the potential for geologic sequestration uh, across the, the, the um, continent. And you can see we have really six main basins. The Texas Gulf Coast dominates, um, and that's where about 75% of the capacity is. Um, but we do have uh, capacity uh, in the Oklahoma area, uh, in the, in the um, uh, Illinois Basin and up in the Dakotas, along with the um, Central Southern uh, Californian Basin. And so in order to uh, accelerate the uptake of CCS, not only for biomass, but also for natural gas with CCS for power or hydrogen, uh, cement plants, etc. We, we decided that we needed a mechanism by which we would encourage investment. So uh, the bioenergy industry doesn't know anything about CCS. So how does it build confidence uh, that CO2 storage would be available? Similarly, how does the, the oil and gas sector who are skilled at the development of, se of geologic sequestration sites, how do they have confidence that this bioenergy transition will actually occur? And so to break this sort of counterparty uncertainty and risk, what we did is we developed an infrastructure play in which we built out a network of pipelines slightly in advance of the transition's needs. And so this goes directly to 2050. And you can see we have a national network of um, uh, CO2 pipeline infrastructure. There is around 100,000 kilometres of pipelines um, across the continent. These, this blue shading here, this is a very large capacity pipeline. This is over 200 million tonnes a year, and it would be represented by uh, two 42-inch or 48-inch pipelines. But you can see across the country, we have two networks, one to the west of the Rockies, one to the east of the Rockies. And we're capturing CO2 from, a, from around 1,600 different facilities. Now, yes, there are cement plants. Yes, there are uh, natural gas power plants and they're hydrogen reforming plants. But around 50% in this scenario is coming from bioenergy plants. So this coupling of CCS uh, with bioenergy turns out to be a really critical component of getting to net zero by 2050. Um, so overall, um, you know, for us, we found two things. One, getting to net zero without CCS was, was impossible and getting to net zero without bioenergy playing a significant role was also um, highly unlikely. So, uh, so yeah, the bioenergy industry is critical. And with that, um, thank you. And I'd now like to hand over to... Um, Dr. Felix from uh, Oxford University, who's a senior research scientist, and um, a hand over to him. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, just going to look to share my screen. So can everyone see this? Yes. Yeah, yes. Great. Thank you all very much. So um, yeah, hello everyone from uh, Oxford in the UK. It's, it's great to be with you all uh, today. 
Uh, my name's Felix Leach, um, and today I want to talk about something a bit different to what the other two presenters have been talking about. I'm not going to be presenting scenario analysis. Rather, what uh, I and my co-author Kelly have done, that's, that's him on the left and me on the right, um, is we've written a book, uh, Racing Towards Zero, that thing in the middle, um, encouraging us to think about how we're going to uh, decarbonize transportation in particular as quickly as possible. Uh, so one of the things that I found, uh, particularly in Europe, is that whenever I talk to people, um, I, I don't necessarily mean experts or professionals, but you know, just people in more generally, um, everyone assumes that in five years time, they'll be driving a battery electric vehicle and the problem is solved. And I certainly believe that the problem's a little bit more nuanced than that, not least because the thought of a battery electric ship or a battery electric aircraft for all the applications that we use ships and aircraft for today, uh, I think is pretty fanciful, at least in the foreseeable future. So that's why Kelly and I have written this book. Uh, so uh, it's clearly impossible to summarize an entire book in, in 15 minutes or so. So what I thought I'd do is I'd go through the uh, chapter titles to begin with, partly because I had a lot of fun coming up with these. Uh, so uh, to begin with, we, we introduce ourselves and sort of say what we're going to talk about, uh, a bit like I've just done now. Um, then we thought we'd start with a history of the automobile because everyone thinks of internal combustion engines as old and battery electric vehicles as new. But in fact, 120, 130 years ago, the same tussle, if you like, was going on already um, between uh, electric vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles. And back then, the internal combustion engine vehicle uh, won, partly because we didn't really understand very much about pollution and climate change back then, but partly because people demanded range and combustion engine vehicles could provide range and battery electric vehicles could not. There's actually a few parallels to today, I think, there. So we thought we'd start by looking back 100 years or so. We then talk about vehicle emissions. We talk about where they come from and what uh, what effects they have on, on us, um, both as humans and uh, on us as a planet. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on in my presentation. Uh, subsequently, yeah. we talk about regulation Let's of emissions. Sorry, sorry, Phil. Sorry. I think um, the screens are, the slides aren't moving along in your presentation. Oh, so I'm really maybe, sorry. That's okay. Um, oh, that's perfect. And maybe just make the screen full screen. Yeah, I will try and do that now. I'm so sorry. Uh, fit slide to current window and can I make this full screen? Will it let me? Are they moving again now, Lauren? I can see your, your second screen now, but they're not, I mean, they're not sliding through. It's gone from the first screen to the second okay. one. Um, I'm sorry. If you want to try, I, stop Can everyone sharing. see if I, I, if I just um, hold it like this, can everyone still see? Albeit with some sort of jazz around the sides. Yeah, we can, as long as you can, can you slide to the third screen and then back again, just to make sure we can see the difference. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. okay. Great. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, clearly, the technology is not liking me this morning. Um, so, yeah, in, uh, in chapter three, um, I think that's where I was. Uh, we talk about where where emissions come from and uh, what they do to both us and our planet. Uh, in chapter four, uh, we talk about the regulation of emissions. This is a, a rather complex area uh, and we've actually gone through and broken down emissions regulations pretty much worldwide. So if you want to know what the emissions regulations are in Kyrgyzstan, we've got them there. Uh, but we've also got some more perhaps common emissions regulations such as the EU and the US, which drive most of the world's regulations. Chapter five, then we talk about diesel and diesel engines. So diesel engines were very popular, particularly in Europe, um, maybe 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, but of course, today they're basically the demon. Uh, so we talk about why that was and maybe whether both of those extremes aren't quite fair. Uh, in chapter six, we introduce battery electric vehicles. We talk about the first rise, if you like, 100 years ago, and then the more recent rise. We discuss the technology and, and, and the sort of attractiveness of those vehicles. Then in chapter seven, we aim to discuss uh, what the, the upsides and downsides are of, of owning and, and running a battery electric vehicle. Uh, chapter eight, then we talk about hydrogen, both in a fuel cell context and uh, the other things that you can use hydrogen for. Uh, 
uh, particularly making other fuels. And that's been alluded to by some of the other presenters already today. Um, in chapter nine, we then talk about the internal combustion engine, uh, where it's come from and where it might go in the future. Uh, and indeed, in chapter 10, we then look forwards to what the internal combustion engine's role might be in, say, 10 and, uh, and beyond years time. Chapter 11, then, is where we get really into the meat of it and what we think we might do going forwards. And, and this is where the message of our book really is. We can't just focus on one solution. There is no silver bullet. We really have to promote a lot of different solutions rapidly. And I think we've actually already seen that from the scenario analysis of the um, of the other presenters today. And of course, those solutions will be different in different markets, different regions and different sectors of the market. Um, in Chapter 12, uh, we discuss what governments have been doing and we suggest that they've been betting it all on BEVs and we might argue that's not necessarily the right option, at least in some markets and some sectors. And then uh, it, we conclude in the final chapter by discussing where we think we might go and what the fastest route to decarbonizing our transport might be. So I'm just going to give you now a few edited highlights from the book. So the first thing I, I want to pick out is how I don't think pollution is a very helpful word. People talk about pollution a lot, but what do they actually mean? So, for example, when the Dieselgate scandal was breaking in Europe, what people really meant by pollution was NOx. But often people mean CO2 when they talk about pollution. So we break down all the different pollutants that we think come from today's cars, so internal combustion engine cars, and their effect on the environment. And just here on this slide, I've given you an idea of how we've done that. So we would argue that some of the pollution is harmless, i.e. nitrogen and water vapor. Some of it is a greenhouse gas and uh, many of it are what we call pollutants. So these are things that uh, may not harm uh, the planet long term, but will certainly be poisonous to us in the short term. And so these have health effects. But of course, pollution doesn't just come from the tailpipe. So this slide here, uh, which is um, uh, this looks at the PM 2.5. So this is particulate uh, matter emissions that are smaller than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. Uh, so historically, the regulation is focused on exhaust um, particulate matter, and you can see why, because um, uh, going back to the year 2000, it really dominated. But actually, the introduction of particulate filters on most vehicles now, um, as, as well as other kind of upgrades and, and legislation driving sharp reductions in uh, exhaust particulate matter, means that in the UK now, uh, the exhaust pollution makes up a really small proportion of the PM 2.5 that we're seeing from vehicles. And actually, it's the brakes, the roads and the tyres. And then what does that mean going forwards? Well, clearly, a battery electric vehicle won't have an exhaust, so you can take out that yellow bit. Um, it will ha certainly have a different braking regime. It may uh, not have brakes, brake, traditional brakes at all. If it uses entirely rheostatic braking, it may have some for emergency use. But certainly the, the orange bar in the middle there can shrink. But then everything else will still yeah. be there. It'll still be driving on a road. It'll still be driving on tires. And indeed, it might be heavier than a traditional vehicle. So you might get more of those tire and road emissions, which are strongly dependent on the vehicle mass. And just to illustrate this, um, this is uh, some work the European Union did. This is, again, the particulate matter. Um, and uh, you can see for a small, medium and large car, so large car, think kind of big SUV, small car is kind of little town car. Um, and this attributes the PM 2.5 and the PM 10, so that's particles uh, smaller than 10 micrometers, to the various sources. But the dashed line that I've put on there is the Euro 6 tailpipe PM limit. So even today, vehicles are emitting far more from non-tailpipe than they are from tailpipe. But none of that, of course, is regulated today. The next thing I, I hope to outline in the book is and lots of people talk about efficiency. And of course, from some perspectives, this is really, really important. But from others, I would argue, and I, I say this controversially, does efficiency matter? Because, of course, vehicle efficiencies can be very, very high for battery electric vehicles. But then depending on where you get the electricity from, the system efficiency can be very low. Similar story for hydrogen. Vehicle efficiencies are, are a bit lower than battery electric vehicles, but higher than internal combustion engine vehicles. But then making hydrogen is quite energy intensive. It's not particularly efficient. Uh, so the system efficiencies can be very low. And uh, I talk about more about what all this means in the book. Um, but the bottom ones are all internal combustion engine vehicles and hybrids. Uh, the middle band are fuel cells and then the top band are battery electric vehicles. But the point is, 
Does it matter? Because if you have a zero CO2 input source, such as solar or wind, then zero multiplied by any sort of efficiency is still zero. Whereas uh, if you're looking at cost, then there are so many other incentives in the market at the moment, particularly for battery electric vehicles, but for other vehicles as well. We shouldn't forget the incentives that are currently uh, available for fossil fuels. Um, those don't necessarily map particularly easily from efficiency onto cost, although, of course, there's an impact. So it's very easy to say, well, a battery electric vehicle is 85 percent efficient, therefore it's better. But I think the reality is a bit more nuanced. And I think we need to ask ourselves the question when we quote these efficiency statistics, does it matter? And what are we actually trying to get across there? Because unlike a traditional vehicle, the system efficiency and the vehicle efficiency don't necessarily map particularly well. Now, given my audience today, I thought I would talk a bit about the fuels discussion that we have in the book. So this being a kind of consumer level book, we start out by talking about the kind of CO2 cycle for fuels. Um, but we also talk not just about biofuels, which I know is of interest to many of you, but also e-fuels. E-fuels are very uh, sort of popular in Europe today. I don't mean that there's lots of them. What I mean is that lots of people talk about them. Um, and, and the cycle is quite similar to those of biofuels with which you'll be familiar, but it relies on carbon capture rather than the plant or biomass growth uh, for the, the CO2 that comes in. Um, uh, but then all of these uh, kind of cycles rely on, on zero CO2 energy uh, being available in large quantities. So uh, that's the sort of the overview of how we can see a vision of a zero CO2 or CO2 neutral, perhaps I should say, uh, pathway for both biofuels and e-fuels. The question then becomes, how might they be used? So uh, in the biofuel case, I think it's pretty likely that E20, so 20% ethanol, will come in, in the EU probably in the next five years. Um, that's quite a useful way of gently decarbonizing, um, i.e. not totally, but, you know, by another 10, 15 percent, probably the existing vehicle fleet as the transition of the vehicle fleet happens in Europe. And it's also worth noting the CO2 intensity of ethanol production really is falling. Um, and that's the graph on the right. The e-fuel forecast, um, I think, is a little bit different. So remember, these are fuels that are made from CO2 but they're very energy intensive and not terribly efficient, dare I say it, having just rubbished the word efficiency, uh, to manufacture. And so my suspicion is that their use will be restricted to very high value applications. Um, what those may be, I, I don't know, but certainly aviation springs to mind. Um, but I think there are serious questions about their economics and energy use. Um, however, if we have a lot of very cheap energy, then they're quite a convenient way of storing energy in a CO2 neutral, possibly even negative way. What are the challenges for both biofuels and e-fuels though that I see? So the big challenge I think is that almost all global regulation is focused on tailpipe. And of course a battery electric vehicle or a fuel cell vehicle emits nothing according to the regulation. Of course, on a life cycle basis, i.e. considering the production, the disposal, the use phase, everything else of that vehicle, we know that it doesn't emit nothing, at least not today, although there's a vision where it might emit nothing. So we argue very strongly in the book that we need life cycle analysis to effectively correctly assess all of these technologies together, because at the moment, regulating by tailpipe really, really favours one particular technology, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and I suspect intentionally. There are also zero carbon fuels um, and, and other presenters have spoken about hydrogen in some detail. Oh, as, as perhaps every slide in, in this presentation, we've taken a slightly higher uh, level view. We're hoping to be able to communicate this more, more widely, not just to, to experts like you all. Um, so we talk about ammonia, which I see as having a role in energy storage. Indeed, here in Oxford, we've got a pilot energy storage plant using ammonia up and running already uh, and hydrogen both of which are zero carbon fuels. Hydrogen is a useful feedstock for other things as well, of course, like an e-fuel. Um, but of course, hydrogen uh, may well be a valuable fuel. I, you could argue the toss about whether it's actually a fuel or not going forwards. But I think it's important that we understand where hydrogen comes from matters. And so colloquially, hydrogen uh, is known by it many colors, a kaleidoscope of colors, you might say. Uh, so there's brown hydrogen, typically made from coal, Grey hydrogen, typically made from, from natural gas or methane, 
It's important to note that both of those processes are incredibly carbon intensive. The brown hydrogen emits about 11 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of hydrogen you produce. The natural gas route emits about six tonnes of CO2 per tonne of um, hydrogen that you produce. Of course, if you can capture that hydrogen, as others have said, because it's a very pure CO2 stream, then you're getting somewhere. And of course, electrolysis is the sort of holy grail. But today, I think it's about less than 2% of the world's hydrogen comes from uh, electrolysis with renewable energy. So there's a long way for us to go to get to carbon neutral hydrogen. Today, the production of hydrogen is very carbon intensive. And so, yes, it annoys me when I see hydrogen vehicles driving around in the UK as they do now, all saying zero emissions. It seems very unlikely to me that that's the case. So what's the message of the book as I sort of begin to wrap up? Really, we say all of these solutions are going to be important, at least in the short to medium term. And one manufacturer I just really want to particularly call out there is Toyota. I think they've taken quite a pragmatic approach to actually quite rapid carbon reduction. And the ICCT in there um, is not actually the most recent report, which came out this last week, which I haven't yet fully read. But in the one before that, they said even under the most optimistic, optimistic decarbonisation scenarios, more than two billion new ICE vehicles will be sold over the next 30 years. It's critical that these vehicles be as efficient as possible. So actually, we argue that hybrids and internal combustion engines in the short term have a really rapid role to play in um, in decarbonising transportation. So these are the eight recommendations that we make at the end of the book. Um, I won't read them out to you because I'm sure you can all read. Um, but suffice it to say, we're saying that there really, really cannot be a silver bullet solution. We're going to need to invest in a lot of these technologies. Battery electric vehicles are really important, but so are other technologies. And I like to end just with a little bit of a, a more fun element to the book. We've tried to make it engaging and readable. Uh, so there, this is a list of things that are and aren't in the book. Uh, so sadly, my publisher was American, so I've had to use American English. Um, but we've got Flintstones references, Star Wars references, Elon Musk makes a few appearances. Everything that's on that slide appears somewhere in the book. And of course, I would say this, but I'd encourage you to buy a copy to find out where. So with that, I will stop talking and hand over, I think, to Keith now, who's going to moderate the Q&A. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Felix. Um, and thank you to all our speakers today for making the time available to uh, present on the, the latest findings and insights from uh, your recent book, Felix. At this stage, we'd like to open up for questions. And if people would like to ask questions, you can type into the chat as to uh, what you would like to ask our speakers about today. Um, it's a great opportunity to get some international perspective. And, and I think it was interesting to see that there were some consistent themes throughout, um, but it's interesting to see the modelling and the context of where uh, the emissions come from, what the technology options are. And uh, I might start it off with, with a question, if I may. Um, in terms of uh, the technologies to proceed with, it, it appears that across all the presentations, there isn't one single solution that is the answer, but a combination of many. Um, how, how quickly do you see the, the reduction in traditional fossil fuels for transport? Are they going to disappear within 10 years or are they going to take longer than that? Or in 2050, are we still going to be using some fossil fuels for things like aviation or something? Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Happy to, to, to jump in quickly and give a bit of a view and then to pass on to, to Chris, Praveen or others. Um, so certainly in the next 10 years, we're, we're not going to succeed in, in phasing out fossil fuel use in, in transport completely. Um, and even by 2050, we still have some residual fossil fuel use in transport and obviously no carbon capture there. So that means net emissions from, from the transport sector. Um, but these really are just concentrated in the most hard to abate sectors, such as what you mentioned. So really looking at long haul aviation um, principally. So most of the long haul aviation is decarbonized with, um, you know, with biojet and so synthetic fuels and biokerosene. Um, but there is still some use of, of um, fossil fuels there. And so that needs to be offset um, with negative emissions, say in, in the power sector, for instance. Um, 
but obviously most of those fossil fuels are phased down and so the, the big message um, for us on say passenger car transport is the the, um, the bans on sales of internal combustion engine cars coming in at 2035 and so that really means that by the time we get to 2050 you've got just about 90 percent of the global passenger car fleet which is an, an electric vehicle um, and then the majority of the remainder of those cars are, are fuel cell vehicles with a small percentage that's that's still running on um, on biofuels with an internal combustion engine so it really is just in the in the hardest to abate sectors where we might still have some residual fossil um, fuel use there and we would say precisely the same based on the US study uh, in fact I wouldn't deviate from that line at all uh, yes I think the only thing I would add is just to say that the infrastructure requirements globally required to do that are immense. You know, there are plenty of places in the world where electricity is not yet available. So to decarbonize the transportation there is a huge challenge. Look, I think I think um, we're all prefacing this by the, the commitment to go to net zero by 2050, as opposed to, uh, you know, it is it is going to be a monumental undertaking without a doubt. Um, and I think we certainly don't underestimate the infrastructure challenge, uh, even in the US, let alone developing countries. Thank you for that. So we've got a uh, question here from Jaden. What incentives are in place for industry to jump onto uh, developing biofuels, and particularly biogas production and the usage for energy production in both the US and Australia? I'm happy to start on, on the US. Uh, I've got a bit of an echo here. Um, look, in, in the US, we have pretty significant incentives available uh, in respect of uh, ethan thing, the things with, that we're not looking to do in the net zero scenario, like ethanol production. So, you know, we need to see some pretty major transitions uh, in terms of both policy, in terms of cropping. Uh, uh, to, to be able to support this. Um, you know, I, I, my sense is that the Biden administration is certainly supportive of the Princeton report and, and you know, has set even more ambitious targets in the near term, below 50% below 2050 by 2030. That's actually slightly more ambitious than us. Um, but there's a long way to go converting that level of ambition into a set of policies that across the board, you know, across all of our six pillars um, will lead to the progress we're looking for. Um, in Australia, I have less familiarity, but my understanding is very limited incentives uh, to, um, to, to push biofuels um, or biogas for that matter. Uh, there are, I think there are incentives on individual projects and there are obviously some, uh, some particular incentives, but I'm you know, I don't think they're anywhere near enough. The other thing we have in the US is a low carbon fuel standard uh, in California, which is driving kind of uh, like zero carbon fuels of all colors, whether it's synthetic fuels, e-fuels, uh, biofuels, um, is driving the uptake of those. And that's actually a pretty powerful incentive, but it is, it is limited to California. But what it does do is um, allow people outside the state to provide fuels for use inside the state. So it does provide the incentives more broadly. Uh, and California is a big market, obviously. I'll just jump in and just to, to say with the question that one of the, the gaps we do see is kind of more policy across the world to incentivize something like biogas, particularly. U.S. is one of the leader, leaders on biofuels policy, but I know even in Europe, there are starting to be some blending mandates for bio, injecting biomethane into the gas grid. But kind of going forward in, uh, we would need more comprehensive policy. And, and one way to start actually would be in more developing countries, including biogas as a clean cooking fuel. It's actually one of the, the near term ways to increase biogas productions in these areas as well. Oh, sorry, Keith, I, you're uh, muted, just to say. Thank you for that. I, I muted myself because of the echo and forgot to turn it off. Okay, um, back to my question for Chris. This one from Andre Lopes. In the net zero America, what were the assumptions behind agricultural practices for the additional biomass case? 
And did you run any sensitivity analysis on the impact of these practices, traditional versus regenerative? Uh, no. Look, we, we basically uh, adopted the USDOE's um, billion ton study, which identified in addition to the residues and the waste streams, um, the full maximum potential of croplands. So in our four scenarios, we, we converted the existing corn ethanol lands across to high yielding energy, like miscanthus and switchgrass, etc. Um, in that extra scenario, then some, uh, some uh, pasture lands were also converted to similar crops. Um, in general, we assumed that um, best practices, agricultural uh, practices would be adopted. Uh, and so we saw pretty good enhancements in soil carbon. So in the ag sector or in the, in the corn ethanol area, for example, that, that contributed 23 million tonnes of additional soil carbon. Uh, and as we, if we expanded that to the full um, billion tonne study, then we'd, we'd get almost double that. But uh, look, I wouldn't say we did you know, we, we were more focused on the overall economy. The, the bioenergy is a significant part, but the downscaling was kind of somewhat limited compared to, say, wind, solar, CCS, uh, and other technologies. Thank you. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment, so I, I might throw one in. So just to call out for anybody who wants to ask a question, pop it in the chat for me. I might just touch base on land use considerations. Uh, how important, and this is just a, a general question for all those speakers, but how important is it in the overall use of biomass and where does it sit with respect to diverting land that's already in agricultural use and redirecting perhaps the crops or reusing the land or using biomass from that land that's already under agricultural use versus the use of new land for, the, for similar purposes? Happy to have a little bit of a stab at that one. Um, and so as Praveen had mentioned, uh, for the IEA net zero modeling, we did this in partnership with Yasser and their global and their Globiome model. And so that's looking at quite a, a detailed regional granularity in terms of what each packet of land is used for um, today and then how that might evolve in the future based on our bioenergy needs from the energy sector. Um, and so in terms of, uh, our approach and sort of constraints on this, we were really trying to say, um, as Chris mentioned, that they did for the, for the Net Zero America study, looking to maintain the existing cropland that's used for food production um, as cropland that's used for food production, and then look at the existing cropland used for bioenergy crop production um, and try and convert that where possible to a more productive um, form of bioenergy production, such as uh, your woody energy crops or, or miscanthus or other things. Um, and so uh, I guess the, uh, the world modelling of this and with trade involved is then trying to um, take into account that um, if we start, for instance, looking at the Australian example, as we discussed the other day, Australia being a net exporter of, of both um, seed crops, crops that could be used for bioenergy or for food. Um, so if we start diverting these more to bioenergy, then we might be creating pinch points in terms of food supply affordability in other areas of the world or the ability and for instance if we're if we're no longer exporting um, as much uh, bioenergy feedstocks to the European Union that might then mean that they are using more land there to to um, to can to produce bioenergy feedstocks so trying to take into account um, those um, sort of balances and then really just to to have a clear message that we don't need to um, to infringe upon the ability to produce food and the affordability of that food, because this is a very honestly a very um, political, politicised, touchy subject. Um, and so it's quite important for us from a messaging perspective to steer clear um, of any controversies linked to that and to focus purely on the benefits and the roles that bioenergy can have and, and try and limit those conflicts there. Our approach, I mean, I've already said that same thing, you know, we, we were very conscious of both the political and the social opposition to seeing a large scale expansion of bioenergy um, because of the food for fuel and, and other sustainability arguments. So by, by simply switching the corn ethanol land and then relying otherwise on residues or waste, um, 
you sort of avoid that argument. We just ran the one scenario um, to, to complete the picture, but, but I think it is a very sensitive issue. The only thing I might add from a sort of British or European perspective is that uh, clearly we're a big importer of biofuels um, uh, over here, uh, but a lot of the, the discussion politically is is more around biodiversity. And I think there's a real tension on, on this kind of sustainability goals of biodiversity um, versus certainly bioenergy, but possibly arguably as well, climate change. You know, it, we're doing a lot of uh, what's called rewilding of some of our areas, so letting them quote unquote return to nature. Uh, it's very trendy at the moment. I think the value of that long term, I think, remains to be seen. But certainly uh, people are very keen. And of course, that's in huge tension with with other demands on land use, particularly bioenergy. And so I suspect that we will remain big importers from whoever will sell it to us. And I'll just jump in to go kind of generally about land use and bioenergy. I know besides food, there are questions around, I know it was mentioned the life cycle analysis of bioenergy. And in terms of expanding it sustainably, we would need a global sustainability governance around bioenergy. So it's not that, um, you know, if you're getting bioenergy, if you're importing it, ensuring that that entire supply chain is as carbon free as possible or low carbon, and that things like land use change are not happening kind of outside of your country if you're bringing the bringing the biomass in so i think that's another sensitivity around bioenergy i know we've had we've had questions around that and in trying to kind of limit our our use of or bringing down the system of bioenergy use to about 100 exajoules to try to avoid some of these these potential issues i've got a, uh, another question here from uh, jasper nord with respect to the co-firing of biomass in the netherlands uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that, and, and what are your thoughts on the, on the viability of that in, in context? So I'll, I'll start off quickly because I think there's some overlap with what I had just mentioned, because I know uh, there's been some, I guess, negative press around forest in, in place like the Nordic regions and their use in, in the power generation there. And in terms of forest management, it kind of goes, goes back in place of ensuring you have strong policy that ensures when you have a forest that the carbon stock is maintained and that if you're, you'll extend it kind of over time so that we're not seeing net CO2 coming out of the management of these forests. I would say, I haven't looked at Norway in detail, but it is a is a leader in some of their very strong sustainability governance around forests. So in terms of their current use, they've been able to expand their forests there while maintaining, keeping an eye on, on their carbon stocks. So as long as it kind of has these very strong governance, there there, it reduces the, the chance for kind of issues in these sectors. So it's kind of a guiding, I see it as an example of a very good governance that we could even replicate in other parts of the world. Interestingly, Australia exports a lot of wood pellets to the uh, Nordic regions for, for that purpose. How would you compare using, uh, and these wood pellets are waste wood residues from saw milling and whatnot, the, the fine wood chips and leftovers, how does it compare in terms of the benefit of you of uh, co-firing them for uh, energy versus perhaps using those same waste residues for perhaps liquid biofuels to offset petroleum products? C certainly, our take um, uh, in the Net Zero America study was that, that rather than co-fire with coal, for example, I mean the the, the most economic way of getting emissions down in the first 10 years is a mixture of renewables and switching coal to gas. Unique case, right? Cheap gas, lots of cheap gas. Um, but the other part of it is bioenergy, biomass is too valuable, right? To be to be very dedicated to power. So what we find is much more valuable in hydrogen and or, and or liquid fuels and, and those sorts of things. So um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure what he means by co-firing, but if, it, if he means co-firing with coal in power production, um, I think there are better things to do with it. Yep. Okay, um, well, we've got a, sorry, sorry no, I'll I'll just jump, jump in there quick, 
Um, quickly, Keith, 100% concur with what, what you're saying there, Chris, but I think it's important to note as well that depending on the scenarios, we're going to need some level of BEX by the time we get to 2050. So if co-firing is seen as a pathway to moving towards 100% firing of, of bioenergy within a power plant, um, then that that's something that we do have some of in the pathway. But obviously here we're looking at bioenergy use in power plants, not to provide um, volume, but really focusing on the power and on, on a dispatchable resource that's there to provide that flexibility. So operating with quite low capacity factors. Yeah, definitely. I agree. It's context specific, not to the US, but, but certainly elsewhere it would make sense. Definitely. And I'll, I'll just jump in and add one last bit on in kind of the near term use of biomass as co-firing versus biofuels. I agree with what Chris was saying that biofuels is the higher value product. But currently, one of the, the kind of innovation gaps is on converting woody biomass, such as these wastes from forestry industries into biofuels. So that needs to be the technology needs to be developed further to reach the scale that then we can start seeing after 2030. Great. Okay, well, we've got a, another question here from Jaden, and this is on uh, waste to energy. Do you see the construction of more waste to energy plants playing a major role in the US and Australia in meeting the net zero target? You know, from our study, uh, we do utilise waste um, for the production of energy. It's a relatively small part of the picture. Um, you know, if you remember the pie chart I showed, it's probably from memory about 5% or less of the potential biomass um, available for energy production, which in turn is 19% of the total primary energy demand. So, so you know, it's a, it's a, it's a 1% or half a percent type, type, type contributor. So it happens, but I don't see it as being a game changer. So Fulcrum at the moment are just commissioning a plant in the USA, for instance, for municipal solid waste as a, an artificial crude initially and then the potential to make into biofuel. So you don't see that as a, a rapidly expanding area, more, more niche? Uh, that, well, that's the way we see it, um, you know, and that's what our modelling suggests. It's also availability of, of the waste, right? It's just not a huge volume uh, relative to, a, to the primary energy demands of a country like the US. Um, in some small countries, it may well be uh, a pretty significant actor, but um, US is a big energy economy, so it's, um, it's context. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. I think the waste to energy, um, in our perspective, it's more a solution to the waste problem. Um, with an added value of energy sales and contributing to decarbonisation than it is a solution to the decarbonisation in the energy sector. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, well, we're getting towards the end of our session. I was just wondering whether the speakers would like to have one final closing statement or summary closing statements of, of where they think the future is. And, and in particular for Chris, for instance, of the scenarios that you were uh, have looked at, which do you think is the most likely and why? Uh, well, I'm happy to answer that question. We're, we're, be, we're very, very committed to saying we don't favour one or the other. The best pathway to net zero is the one you actually can get done. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of uncertainties. You know, we don't control future policy settings. We don't control, you know, what what the private sector will kind of get its teeth into to begin uh, or what the public will accept, you know, whether the public says no to large scale transmission or, or nuclear, then that's going to set the guidelines for what's possible. So we're sort of pretty open minded about the transition. Uh, the one thing we would say is that, you know, bioenergy and particularly bioenergy with CCS is a critical component. It may not be the biggest component of the transition, but without it, net zero looks highly, across the entire economy, taking into account natural systems as well, looks like a tall order without bioenergy with CCS. Um, I would definitely concur with that and looks like a, a tall order that's more expensive as well as being potentially um, um, unachievable. 
and and I guess as well, IEA is very much takes a, a technology neutral approach that integrates and, and looks at the the, the country specific context. So really, the message is just go hard, go fast with whatever's working now to take those technologies that are available and deploy them as fast as possible over the next ten years. But at the same time, don't forget that um, in parallel, we need to be thinking about what's coming after and how to deal with those remaining hard to abate sectors. Exactly. And just adding to that in our NETSA report, it's very much um, positioned as just a one pa potential pathway to net zero, so not the pathway, but meant to inspire action and kind of highlight that there needs to be a lot of action in the next 10 years to set ourselves up for achieving net zero in 2050. And for me, I would just say that I think that there are two points that I think are really important. Firstly, it's not just about what happens in 2050, but it's the pathway you take to get there. And if you know the CO2 emissions, it's the integrated area under the curve that matters, not the, the fact that the curve might reach zero in 2050. So how we get there is important. And speed, I think like you were saying, Chris, is really, really important here. Um, the other thing I would say is this isn't just an engineering problem. You know, we have some technical solutions that will get us there. Yeah, there's some more work to do on them, of course. But this is also really a political and a policy problem. We've already seen arguably governments brought down by renewable energy policies already, for example, in Northern Ireland. France came really close with the tax on diesel. Um, so, you know, there is clearly a huge political journey that we need to go on to bring people along with us on this net zero journey, as well as, of course, all the engineering and innovation that's required too. Okay, well, on, on that note, uh, it's just about going 5.30 in Australia at least, uh, which is the end of our session. So I would like to thank all of our speakers for their time today, and I might let Georgie close for us. Sure, thank you so much. Thanks, Keith, for moderating. You've done a wonderful job. And thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us, um, giving us your time, often at very inconvenient times, uh, time zones for you. So we really appreciate you joining us. Um, as I did mention at the start, this session has been recorded. So um, we'll, we'll let you know when it has been released onto YouTube and do feel free to share it far and wide. Really appreciate